go through this cube. Let's try that. Just to show you what a collider is. See, I cannot go through this cube. That's because it's a collider. Now, in some cases, I want to be able to run through something, but at the very moment I, I come within a particular defined region of that object, I want Unity to tell me in code. Uh, as it stands right now, I can have an on collider enter piece of code assigned to this that Unity will call. But that assumes there's physics happening. Maybe I don't want physics. I just want to say, hey, when you run within range of this coin, let me know in code. Don't stop my player from running, because that's going to make him look kind of messed up. He's going to run along, hit a coin, and he's going to stagger. I don't want that. I want to, in theory, be able to run right through that coin. But the moment I touch that coin, tell me in code, and then I can pick up that coin, make it disappear, or do something with that. And so let's look at what we can do here for that. If I go to my scripts, I have a pickup script, pickup coin. Let's load up that code. And it just really requires one thing. Um, it requires that your coin has a collider on there, and that that collider is a special type of a collider called a trigger. Why are we using triggers? What's the difference? A trigger is when we don't want a real physical interaction. We don't want something to bounce off it to hit it. We're just saying, hey, I want you to, de to do a region detection, and when something comes within range, call my code. That's it. Don't stop the object. I'll, I'll handle all that. And so that code in pickup coin, I've got a little code in here for debugging, but basically the code that we're looking at is this guy right here. It's one code method. You see this code all the time. On trigger enter, and Unity will call this on both game objects uh, that the collision happens between. So in other words, when they become within range of each other, one object's collider passes, uh, it comes in contact with another object's collider, and one of them is set as a trigger. It calls this method, and it will give you saying, hey, here is the collider of the other object you've just hit. Well, remember, collider is a component. So if we look at this, for example, we see that there is a collider on here. If I want to know who this is, I don't, I don't care who the collider is. I want to know who the collider's game object is. And so in our code, we can say, when I collide with this collider, let me know who its game object is. And then let's look at that game object's tag and see if it's player. If it is, we're going to do some code. Uh, let's just, we'll keep it really basic to start. And we'll just say destroy myself. I can't say this. If you're writing code, it might seem like I want to destroy this. This is actually an instance of the pickup coin script. That's not what we want to destroy. We want to destroy essentially this.gameObject, but we can just leave this out. Lowercase g, not capital G. C sharp is a case sensitive language. Do not use capital G because that's for doing things like game object dot find game object with tag. When we want to refer to this game object, lowercase g. All right, let's take that code and I can actually um, assign it to this big Q if I want. We'll do the coin in a second. This will give you a nice big demo to look at. Okay, take that code, drag it onto our cube here. And now this is not a trigger. So we need to make that a trigger, otherwise it will not call on trigger enter. Okay, let's save that. Run that, and let's, boom. As soon as I hit it, it called this code method. In fact, I can even just debug this if we want. Attach to Unity, wait for that to start. Debugging is super easy with Visual Studio Tools for Unity. Click play over here. Now when my main player, who has a collider on it, comes within range, this boxes uh, trigger. It's a collider with the trigger checkbox checked off. When it comes within range of that, it will call our code. So let's hit this guy right. There we go just happens. There's a game object tag, is player. There's all of our game object properties, it's vamp kid, perfect. F5 to continue, all done. So let's take that code and drag it onto that coin because we can just reuse that same code. So take our coin, 
at our code there. And we talked a little bit about prefabs. Let's go ahead and make a prefab out of this coin. So I like to do that in the prefabs folder. Uh, and I've actually had this coin started. Let me just create a new temporary folder here just so I can uh, show you this demo. Take my coin starter, drag it down here. Okay, now it has, uh, we still need a collider on here. So let's go ahead and add uh, this shape. We have a couple different colliders we could use. Um, it doesn't have to match the shape exactly. Let's do a sphere collider. Make that a trigger. And now notice, see that sphere that surrounds that object? That's the range that we need to come within. Uh, that's pretty close. We can, we can make this a little bit bigger if we want, meaning if we come within that range, we'll pick the coin up. The cool thing with using a prefab is so we can just do that, we can do that. We have all these reusable instances. And let's go ahead and change. Let me just do one thing here. Apply those changes to my prefab. There we go. So if I change any one of these prefabs, like for example, if I change the radius on this one prefab, and I like that change, and I want to apply it to these guys, I click Apply, and it updates this, and pushes that back out to the scene again. All right, so all we did, we added a collider, and added that code that had that one method in there. On, trigger, enter, that's all we care about. And there's also 2D versions. So there's on, trigger, enter, 2D. Uh, there's on, trigger, exit, when they leave each other. And there's also on, trigger, stay, which is called constantly, while these objects are in uh, contact with each other. Let this compile, and we should be able to run right through and pick these guys up. OK. I'll clear that breakpoint so we don't see it every time here. Perfect. All done. Now let's take this one level further here. So that was just destroying it, but let's actually, let's actually pick it up, so to say. All right, this is going to get slightly more complicated. We're going to call this method called pickup. What is pickup going to do? Let's see. Let's run this, get the visual on it, and then we'll actually walk through the code. Now, these have an audio um, source component on them. You can see the little speaker on them. Let me turn this up so you can hear it on my microphone here. And watch what happens. So we picked it up. It made a little coin sound, because each one of these has an audio source. Um, and then it actually took those coins and spun them up to the corner. And that has some challenges, because if we look at this coin, and when I pick it up, I'm going to quick move my, my screen away here. Right? I'm shaking it, but it's still consistent. Like No matter where I look, it moves up there just fine. So how does it do that? Well, the first thing that we need to do is as soon as we touch this coin, we are changing the parent of that coin. Now, the parent-child relationship in Unity is kind of interesting. If we take any, um, any game object, let's just take this coin, for example, and make it a child of my zombie. Now, when I move my zombie, child of that guy. Now, let me move my zombie here. Notice any child moves with the parent. So let me undo that change. So we're taking that coin and making its parent the camera, meaning wherever we look, that coin is now going to be, uh, it's a child of the parent, it's going to follow that parent around. Then we do something called uh, a coroutine. We covered coroutines in our first Unity course uh, that we talked about earlier, the ak.ms forward slash free Unity training. Quick refresher on coroutines. This kicks off, think of it as a separate task. It's not a separate thread. Uh, Unity uses a coroutine system. So think of it as a separate task. You're saying, hey, I want you to create this separate task and then go ahead and play that sound. So it's not going to wait for this to finish. It's going to kick this off separately. Then right after it kicks off that separate task, it's going to uh, play the audio source on this coin. So it's getting that component and playing it. Getting that component, what does that look like? 
on that coin, is there an audio source? Sure, we see a speaker on there. So get component audio source returns this, and play simply plays that sound. Now let's look at this. This is the interesting thing here. Uh, start a coroutine, move to score. A coroutine always has this format. It's I numerator. It looks a little bit weird. It's just that's how these uh, methods are defined. While true, which seems like an infinite loop, but what we're doing is we are going from our screen coordinates to our world coordinates. Now in Unity, these are screen coordinates, and as we look around the world, those are world coordinates. Screen coordinates go from 0, 0 all the way up to our screen width and screen height values. So 0, 0 to screen width and screen height. And so what we're saying is we need to find out, uh, we need some point in our world, which is going to be our upper uh, left-hand corner in our window. So we're going to say uh, starting at 0, which is all the way to the left, and then we're going to go, it's kind of reversed the way you think about it. So it's 0, and then our height is actually up here. So 0, 0 is down here, and height. So we need to take our coin and move it up to the upper left-hand corner, which is 0 and screen height. We're going to set this coin's transform position. And remember that a transform position is right here. On any game object, we can change its position. And so we can just do that in code. We change its transform position. Uh, we're going to lerp it to this world point. What is lerp? Every frame this processes, we're going to move it a little bit at a time. Uh, it's a frame-based system, so we need to do something a little bit at a time and move and move and move. So this is our coin's position. And every frame, we're going to come back in and move it just a little bit more. Lerp is a pretty common use function. It looks a little weird at first, where it takes two values um, and then a value between 0 to 1 uh, on what percentage to move the object from point A or move the value from point A to point B. So if I have a value of like um, 0 and 10 and I'm moving it by 0 0.1, it's going to return a value of 1. In other words, 10% between 0 and 10. So it returns a percentage between those two points. And every frame we're going to move closer and closer and closer to that world point. If we get close, we're going to destroy our coin because we don't need any more. And then we're all done. Now, when we're all done here, this is where we can do something like keep score. So uh, notice we're not doing any score keeping here. So let's change that. Um, when our coin wakes up, let's go ahead and say we have a player score game object. Uh, uh, let me rephrase that, a player score component. Make, make this private. That player score exists on our main player. So if we look at um, our vamp kid, we can see he has a player score that is just set to 0, 0, 0 right now. So we need to ask Unity, hey, Unity, I would like a reference to this so I can update these values at runtime. And so in order to get that, we first have to find the vamp kid, and then we have to ask for this component. So find vamp kid, ask for the component. Game object. And remember I said it's a common task to find game object with a tag, player. And you can type that out if you want. One of the techniques I like doing is you can have a class defined or an enum or structure, depending how you like it, where you just don't have to type it every time. And it kind of prevents the, the old fat fingering where you kind of type it in incorrectly. So you can either type it in or you can have these values you refer to. So this is a little bit uh, less prone to typing errors. Errors are bad. We don't like errors. Find our game object. That's our player. Perfect. And then we can say our player score. We can actually do this all in one line. I just want to break it out a little bit. Equals vamp kid dot get a component on the vamp kid. Get me his player score, a reference to that code that's instantiated on our vampire. So these two lines will find the vampire and get a reference to this guy right here. Perfect. And then once we actually pick up a coin, once we get close enough that we're going to destroy our coin, at that point in time, we will say our um, coin score plus equals 1. In other words, increment it by 1. 
Uh, this is a little bit of what they call a brittle implementation. Um, ideally, I would probably want a method I call into and give it a value of how much to increase. Just to make sure multiple things are in calling at the same time, there's a couple, just, there's a little bit slightly better way to write